Good morning, Vietnam. It's another episode of Vietnam Innovators. I'm your host, Hal. Uh, today we have a guest. Uh, she makes a lot of coffee, among other beverages. Yes. Uh, Patricia Marquez, she's the CEO of Starbucks Vietnam. Uh, it's quite the pleasure to have you on the show, Patricia. I know you've been on the media quite a bit for other reasons, uh, but today is one of your first uh, live appearances, I guess you could say, on a podcast. So thank you for making time here today. Uh, we you. had a chat a couple months ago. You had a lot to share, and I'm very excited for you to be here and to share with our audience uh, kind of the thinkings, the insights, the learnings that you've had, not only as CEO, but your partners, your employees of Starbucks. I'm sure they've had quite a bit as well. Before we go into it, Patricia, we're going to do some quick fire TikTok one minute style videos so please bear with me this might be your first time on TikTok. i think first question patricia what brought you to vietnam phone call from a friend asking for help what excites you about vietnam everything what's an innovation at starbucks that you're most proud of ensuring that our partners and communities are very close to each other how is starbucks different from other starbucks around the world we speak vietnamese what's a starbucks Vietnam drink that could go global. Dolce Misto. What's your go-to Starbucks order? Coffee of the day. On a Sunday at 10 a.m., where would you be and what would you be doing? Most likely walking, heading to some outdoors activity. What's your favorite Vietnamese word or phrase? Choi yoi. <laughs> Isn't it everyone's? <laughs> and last question, uh, if I were to search you on ChatGPT and ask what it would say about Patricia, what would it say? That I'm boring. Boring. Okay. <laughs> All right, Patricia. Well, Predictable. Let, let's see how those TikTok uh, one minute style videos do. Uh, we'll share that to your team after. Let's get straight into it. Uh, sure. Patricia, you've been in the media for a lot of, you could say, the wrong reasons. And, you know, I'm here today to learn about what you're thinking. Uh, about not just Starbucks and the brand, but coffee generally in Vietnam. I think here in Vietnam, people think cheap coffee on the street, coffee's made here, how could it be anything premium or um, sought after? And you know, I, I personally disagree, but the audience here, I'm sure, is here to, to learn a little bit about that. But let us just start with your journey of becoming CEO of sure. Starbucks Vietnam. You mentioned you had a phone call from a friend. Let's play that out. What, the, what was that like? I'm, yeah. I'm curious myself. Yeah. It really happened like this. I was working for a fashion brand. It was the 2009, uh, 2010 debacle. And uh, the crisis, the world crisis had reached out everything luxury. So my role was, I would say, irrelevant and pretty boring to just wait and see what would happen. When I received a phone call from a very good friend of mine, ex-colleague of Starbucks, mm. in my years of Starbucks partner, okay. and he was coming to Vietnam to take over a Vietnamese company and needed some help. Okay. And that's how I decided, well, as good as any time to, to go and uh, see what I can learn and see what is there. H had you been me. to Vietnam before? I had been to Vietnam years before in a very short cruise. Mm. This was a stop of the cruise. Okay, and b before coming here, you were in Peru, which is where you're from? I or was, where? no, I was not in Peru. I was actually working out of a very large brand in the US. And at the time of the call, I was actually in Dubai, I believe. Okay. So a bit yeah. of a global citizen, yeah. um, almost 10 plus years now in Vietnam, is that right? Yes, uh, Yes. 13, 13 to 13. be precise. And almost 10 as Starbucks Vietnam CEO. Almost 11. Almost yes. 11, okay. Setting up a new business in Vietnam in a new market, I get so many questions from business leaders around the world, curious about Vietnam. But more importantly, uh, related to what your business, which is the coffee uh, business, uh, coffee culture here, at least in the media, it's it portrays Vietnamese coffee as X, Y, Z. I think I, I don't need to tell our audience. I think they can imagine it already. And and Starbucks is a bit of a, a challenge uh, in a sense. You you would think just the setting, the ambiance, the product. Could you tell us more about the initial obstacles you faced and what some of those, <clears throat> how you overcame them as partners sure. of Starbucks? I think. Um, there are two, two parts to this question, mm. right? One is, 
the differences between local coffee and Starbucks or any other organized retail coffee shop, I guess. And the second is the challenges of opening here. I think uh, to your question about the challenges, opening a new market away from your country, whether it's Peru or the U.S. where Mm -hmm. I'm a citizen of, is a challenge. It is, for that matter, it's a challenge in Peru and the U.S. as well, right? Just to go through the process of opening a new brand Mm -hmm. in a new territory Mm -hmm. is a challenge. And the challenge has to do with how you put the team together. Not always you can bring, you import your team to set up the brand, any brand. So you have to convey the message of the brand to Mm -hmm. an initial team. So putting that team together, uh, and they are navigating the cultural differences. Let me phrase the question in another way. Were there a lot of skeptics about what you were trying to do? And wh- why were they skeptical? Was it because it could make the headlines? Was it because mm-hmm. they were somehow against the uh, changing of Vietnamese culture? Like, what, what, who are those skeptics, if any, at first? I wouldn't call them skeptics mm. because... When we came, there were two other international brands operating mm. coffee shops. So we were not the first ones. Okay. And how do they do in the market? They were doing fine. Okay. One of those brands had over 20 mm. locations in different places, in different wards. And so it was not a CBD operation only. Gotcha. Um, as a matter of fact, they even had... Uh, they, they had a few of the branches outside Ho Chi Minh City. Mm -hmm. So my assumption is they're doing well, right? Mm -hmm. They were, there was a regional brand operating in Vietnam already. So when I came, there was nothing new except our brand, Starbucks, coming to Vietnam. As CEO, uh, you've been here a few years before taking on this role, of course. Uh, What were your first strategies as CEO to make sure that Vietnamese would think about Starbucks in the way that you wanted them to and to welcome the kind of different tastes and and delivery of the products. Because most Vietnamese are used to the ambiance, which is sitting on the street, outside with friends, on on low low plastic stools. Suddenly you've got a different experience. How how was it like? Overall, the strategy, us uh, developing brands Hmm. internationally has always been to surround myself with the right people. Right. You have to have local professionals that will support you and you will support them. Mm -hmm. You have to put a team together, cannot do this on your own. Mm -hmm. So that was the first thing I did. And I am uh, very proud to say that I put on a very strong team that has been with me throughout. So I have a few members of that team that uh, together with me celebrated the 10 year anniversary just last week. Okay, you know, I've been alluding to it a little bit and um, some of the international media, such as CNBC, for instance, uh, there's a clip, uh, we might share the link online or you can just search it online, where international media, they've been saying that Starbucks has just not done well. In fact, going as far as to say it's failed in Vietnam. I actually know somebody at CNBC who was not part of this series, And he said there was a joke back in the day that the producers at CNBC would be finding every single excuse to say, oh, this business failed in this country. There was like a number of these kind of videos. And these media have questioned the success of Starbucks. I live here in Ho Chi Minh City. I see the Starbucks doing fairly well. I'm not there all the time. I'm not like analyzing, you know, how many covers you're doing, Mm -hmm. what the turnover is like. But how do you respond to that critique? is there anything that's been misunderstood that you'd like to maybe share on today's podcast? Or maybe some sure. of it's true. Definitely not true. Mm-hmm. I'm sitting here today talking about the brand because mm-hmm. of 10 years of consistent growth, mm-hmm. um, great results, amazing reception from the local communities. And uh, we have become an integral part of the life of many of our customers, Mm -hmm. right, that visit us 
on the daily basis. So I think <clears throat> perhaps success and failure means different things for different people. Mm -hmm. I said at the beginning, I'm predictable, so and probably boring. So I'll say for me, success means we're in business. We are successful financially. We continue to grow. Mm -hmm. We have 1,200 Vietnamese employees working for the company. We are in six major cities. At this time, I have a pipeline of new openings that is probably overwhelming. <laughs> And I'm driving my team crazy on scheduling those openings um, sharply. So I've got another side question to that. So in the video and other, not just the CNBC one, but other media have said when Starbucks first launched, the aspirations were much larger that I think Starbucks is approaching 100 stores in Vietnam yes. after 10 years, which is no small feat. That's a huge accomplishment. So congrats to, you, to the team. But some were saying, oh, that should have been done years ago. But the reason why they haven't is because of all these critiques that they mentioned. What's your response to that? Did you meet those expectations yes. when you first launched okay. Starbucks? So first, for all of those who um, make those comments, mm -hmm. maybe I'll invite them to come to Vietnam and okay. start up oh. a company. Okay. <laughs> um, and face the challenges yeah. that you face. Mm all very unique to each of the markets where you work. So I'm sure they face challenges everywhere. Here, one of the biggest challenges is the availability of real estate. Mm. Even if you can see yourself opening, like many come to the market, put a press conference together, mm. announce the arrival of a brand, yeah. and also announce the opening of 100 stores in the first three years of operation. I have yet to see one of those messages so my, becoming my a reality. So my follow-up question there is, and it's not just for Starbucks, it's for a lot of international brands, or just brands in general. Yeah. Like homemade brands here yeah. in Vietnam, they want to do a thousand stores, and maybe they do, but then they have to close half yes. of them after, right? Yes. Um, there's been a lot of examples of that. Yes. Is it about setting the wrong expectations then? Is, was, has there been maybe a misconception about the, the growth opportunity? I mean, the growth opportunity is there in Vietnam, but you know that's all the positive fluffy stuff, right? Is there a backside of the doing so business in Vietnam that people should? So let me give you an should... example. Let me give you an example. So 2018, right? The brand is solid. We've opened so many stores. We have a three-year plan ahead of us. Mm -hmm. And here comes COVID. Mm -hmm. So... Who in the business of retail uh, of any kind have grown during COVID? A lot of this media was before COVID, though. What, what's, your, what's your reply to that? Well, I was measuring it to the 10 years, 100 mm. stores. So okay. um, if you come from prior to COVID, again, I have to say we are a company that bets on long-term plans. Mm. Right. We have a long term strategy. We see Vietnam exactly the way you describe it. Enormous potential, huge pop young population, mm -hmm. big lovers of coffee, good coffee, where we were just talking um, a few minutes ago about AC, mm -hmm. for example. Right. right. We are a supplier of great environment mm -hmm. where customers come to enjoy a great cup of coffee or a tea or a refresher while enjoying a great environment with friendly people around them. Does Starbucks stand to gain from the change of consumer behaviors too? So what I mean by that is, for example, you mentioned young people. Mm -hmm. uh, Vietnam is one of the fastest growing, not just populations, but young populations in the world. I read an interesting statistic that every year in Vietnam, which is a little under 100 million people, there's 1 million people becoming 18 years old. Mm -hmm. And that's generally, I guess, when people start thinking about coffee. I think I had my first coffee yeah. around that time. Yeah. It didn't really become a regular until maybe early 20s. Yes. Um, do you think Starbucks has stands to benefit from that demographic trend? Because, I mean, Starbucks is not cheap compared to the market average. Mm -hmm. So it was young people driving that in general. Do they have the spending power to, to match that? I love your comment on that. Yeah, I think... The Gen Zs are not only um, a generation that we see as part of our customer profile. Mm. Our research and development 
department in Starbucks uh, International does a phenomenal, phenomenal work doing exactly that, right? Ensuring that they evolve from the typical cafe latte to what is the desire of this generation. So I believe with, in that respect, we're well covered. Mm. You probably as a customer can see that we have uh, limited time offerings throughout the year. So that uh, introduces new flavors, new drinks, new composition of drinks, less milk, more milk, plant-based, etc. So I think we appeal to a much broader audience than simply coffee. Go- going back to one of the rapid fire questions I had earlier today, which was how is Starbucks Vietnam different from Starbucks around the world? And you mentioned the Vietnamese language, which of course is very important. How different is the actual experience though? Yeah, some drinks may be localized here and there, but is the music the same, the furniture the same, the so, Starbucks gift card use, the UI UX of the customer experience? Yeah. It's pretty much all there, you would say? I, I think in general, Starbucks mm-hmm. is a Starbucks and the expectation of a uh, um, Peruvian visiting Vietnam mm. will probably be, oh, it is very similar. Mm. However, we talked about the weather Right. Mm. So our probably our patios in our stores are less relevant mm. than in other countries, considering the rainy season and considering how hot it might get. In Hanoi, patios work better mm. because they have the four seasons. Mm. So I think uh, architecturally we adapt different mm-hmm. design wise we are very relevant to the market yes. we're in. Yeah, right? I saw a Hoi An location yes. in Old Town, I believe. Yes. And there's one in Ho Chi Minh City, I think in, I forget, Cac Mang Tang Tam, I think. It's got this really funky, like, I can't even describe it, like a uh, brutalist kind of architecture yes. from like the 50s or 60s, perhaps. Yes. Um, so you yes. can kind of very go art anywhere. Deco. And, yeah, yeah, very good. Yeah, yeah, I think, uh, I think we do that uh, pretty well. Mm. When we re- when we select a location, we do quite a bit of investigation. Who's around? Who's our customer? Mm. What what community are we representing in mm. that location? So that's that's one difference. Probably you will not see a, a Vietnamese Starbucks coffee store mm. in replicated in Malaysia or in Peru. So those are unique. I have a um, question. You mentioned community and mm-hmm. where the locations go kind of inform that. Mm-hmm. If you had to kind of pick and design a personality that represented the typical Starbucks customer in Vietnam, what would that person look like? Are they a mom? Are they in their 30s with two kids living in a certain part of Ho Chi Minh City? I would, I would love say, a, a quick persona test on that. I would say is a young female probably executive. They all have amazing positions in many (laughs) well-known companies Mm. showing up on the weekend with their kit and uh, attending to their emails while the kid runs around (laughs) and enjoys um, a cream frappuccino. Okay. She's savvy and is waiting for her husband, who's a young, probably entrepreneur. Okay. I, I think uh, the Vietnamese Starbucks consumer mm. is quite diverse. Mm. We have a range of age, definitely male, female, probably 50 50, mm. if not scientifically very close to. Mm. Age average is very different depending. On the community. And how does it vary compared to what you expected when you, 10 years ago, let's roll back the clock a little bit. You've been with Starbucks 11 years. What you just described as the typical customer, would you have expected that 10 years ago? Maybe because I've been here before opening Starbucks, Mm. I had already immersed myself in the social arena of of Vietnam. Mm -hmm. So I felt... Yes. Pretty confident. Yes. yes. Okay. Of course, uh, the very first six months is a lot of um, investigation, mm. a lot of curiosity. Favorite drinks of the first six months were very different than the drinks today, mm. right? 
We have a much larger consumer of coffee and uh, espresso than we had the first three months. Mm. So, um, yeah. I, I want to debunk a few myths, um, which, again, going back to the international media, that's one of the core reasons I wanted to have you on the show today. Because, you know, when I listen to these programs by international media, some of them have never even been to Vietnam. They just look online and just slap some numbers on there and call some people. Yeah. I had an interesting uh, discussion with the CEO of uh, another uh, more mass market product, uh, F&B brand, food and beverage brand, won't name names, but their ambitions a few years ago, again, this was all pre-COVID, was to have a thousand locations in Vietnam. And this particular store was slightly above average Vietnamese food with uh, a bit higher pricing as a result. And it just didn't work for them because in their analysis uh, after the fact, when they made that grand ambition of opening a thousand stores, mm. they felt like th their customer was kind of what you described, maybe a little bit uh, just one uh, kind of age rung, rung lower in terms of income and their career progression, uh, making 20 to 30 million a month. They determined after the fact that there just weren't enough people making that kind of income to support a thousand stores in Ho Chi Minh City. So my question for you, and that's Hanoi too, sorry, uh, in the two metro cities. Mm -hmm. So my question for you, and I, Starbucks is at 100, almost 100 now, I believe. You won't say how many it could be. It could be 500,000 in 10 years, who knows? My question for you, and this is for the business people that are thinking about coming here who have perhaps similar customer sets. Are there actually enough Vietnamese at that you know, young woman, white collar office worker to drive that kind of consumer spending at where Starbucks is? That's a that's a question that I have that a lot of business owners so, would love to let know. me go back to your example of this other brand. Mm. I find it irresponsible, perhaps, to say that I'm going to open a thousand stores mm. when I haven't probably don't even have a proof of concept, mm. right? So I don't know what the intention of that announcement was. The difference between us and probably somebody that just came up with an idea of a new concept is that we are a 60 year old brand. <laughs> the proof of concept is already been done. Mm. Let me go back to your question about the criticism of us being a failure versus a success. My biggest responsibility is to ensure that each and every one of our stores is open in the right place for the right reasons. Mm. And when I say the right reasons, I, I talk about length of lease, for example. Many companies sign leases for 12 months. 12 months? Yes, yes. What do they expect to happen after 12 months? <laughs> Close and move or just impress the, the media with 1,000 stores that yeah. will last for one year. Wow. So if I go back to your first question, my biggest challenge was real estate mm. because 11 years ago that was the de facto no one would sign a lease for you mm. with you for more than 12 months that was the practice in vietnam was because landlords months, were just used yes, to turnover and yes. jacking up rents or probably and so uh, the, the didn't relationship know. seems like a bit hostage kind of situations yes. like you got 12 months and <laughs> you have 12 who can recover a capex so that, that's one of your you? main reasons for taking the time you've yes. to, to expand diligently yes. and responsibly yes. and responsibly okay. Okay. Um, we are a sustainable company right i don't want to toss away not only the capital investment but the furniture the equipment mm. and just toss it <laughs> away we are there to to build a relationship with the community with our customers with our landlords let's say i'm a landlord yes here in vietnam yes i'm hearing today's podcast with you patricia yes and it's making me think how can i get starbucks as my tenant so what what's the ideal trait of a uh landlord or someone you know someone left, left leasing out property here in vietnam for a starbucks and your team to be like, okay, these are 
green flags, green lights, let's go. Great question. I'm going to use the opportunity to advertise. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, instead of doing a research on my own, please listen to what I am about to say. Starbucks is here for the long term. We will continue to grow. And we are always, always looking for great locations with amazing landlords. What do I mean by amazing landlords? This has to be a, a, a contract that benefits us both, right? That being said, the first year's challenges were mm -hmm. not only the length of the lease, mm -hmm. but also the bizarre numbers that were thrown at us. I have a question about that. So 10 years ago, which was pretty early in Vietnam terms, in terms of more premium, I guess is one way to put it, relative to the market at least. You think, oh, big American brand name. Oh, Patricia, big time CEO. Let's jack up the rent. <laughs> you know, was that one of the experiences you had? Yes. So, mm -hmm. that, and that's not rational. No. Uh, that makes no, just because we're a big company doesn't mean to. <laughs> not only that, I can sit down with any landlord that tells me that they want to make a fortune with us in a seven to 10 year lease, how things work, right? We sell coffee. <laughs> we don't sell handbags. We don't sell suits. We don't sell China. We sell coffee. So the math is very simple. Any interested party that wants to become my landlord, I invite you to visit any of our stores, check our menu board, our pricing, and just observe the amount of customers that walk in and out mm -hmm. of our cafe. And that will give you a very good idea of how much a coffee shop can pay for rent. Would you say the market for landlords and just real estate in general has rationalized a little bit over time or yes. has it gotten worse? No. Okay, it's gotten better. better. And why has it gotten better? Two reasons. Because before, I was probably one of the first big brands. So they were testing me. Mm. <laughs> so to all the news reporters that consider that because I was responsible and waiting for the right locations, I fail, then so be it. I can say that uh, they have evolved with us. They recognize that it doesn't work. Mm. And let me give you a very good example. In year two and year three, other F&B retailers or coffee brands used to make fun of me because they got location A or B or C because, and I didn't have it. Mm. And I would just think, yeah, I was offered that location first, but I declined to take that location. So, Good luck. Mm -hmm. Sure enough, I can tell you factually that one, two, and three have probably turned over 10 times since the day I declined to take over that location. Let's talk about geographic expansion too. Yes. Um, from what I understand, the first 20 were predominantly Ho Chi Minh City, correct me if I'm wrong, and a bit of You're Hanoi. Wrong. I'm wrong, okay, yes. so Hanoi was there, okay. <laughs> so mostly cities, basically. Uh, in recent months, you guys have opened in the Central Coast, so uh, Hoi An specifically, you've opened in Phu Quoc. I actually knew somebody uh, that was going to be working at Starbucks as your operations director or manager, and they were asked to move to Phu Quoc, and they're like, oh no, we're not gonna do that. <laughs> I, I, I wanna stay in the city. What's the rationale behind that expansion? And what's driving the interest to go to these secondary, secondary cities now? Is it, you know, you think Hoi An and Phu Quoc, those are big tourist spots, right? So what, what's driving the decision-making behind that? Okay, so first, um let me correct you. Sure. So we opened year one, mm -hmm. Ho Chi Minh City. Okay. And in year two, we went to Hanoi. Mm. So year two, we started operating two cities. Okay. Of course, we recognize Vietnam is a large geographically speaking country. So naturally, we are going to set foot on other cities. And we did it in a very rational 
a way, right? We open Ho Chi Minh. It's some people can defer and say, well, we should have opened Hanoi first. Mm. That's that's opinion. We had our office in Ho Chi Minh, so naturally we opened Ho Chi Minh first. Mm. Second, we opened Hanoi. Number three, naturally, you don't have to be smarter than anybody. The third largest city is Da Nang. Mm -hmm. So there we went and we opened Da Nang. Uh, number four, we opened Haiphon. And why did we open Haiphon? Because we started building a small support center in Hanoi, mm. which allow us to extend our arms outside the city. We had the opportunity. We had a good offer with a great landlord that tick all the boxes. Mm. So we went to Haiphong. Um, then we extended, of course, we had already been going outside CBD, we went to District 2 in Ho Chi Minh, we went to District 7, etc. And then we had the opportunity to open Nha Chang. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop there a little mm -hmm. bit. And I can see the path already. But one question I wanted to ask was, year two, you were already in Hanoi. For example, some other American or international brands that are not in coffee and other F&B businesses took quite a long time to go to Hanoi. What, what triggered the, the expansion to outside of Ho Chi Minh City fairly quickly relative to other international brands? Was it uh, perhaps the customer base was relevant for Starbucks? Was it, because um, you could say like, is that too early to, to go out of home base when home base is not yet, the, the foothold's not as strong yet? Mm, I can question. answer by hindsight is always sure. 2020, yeah. right? So <laughs> would I do it differently? Did I know COVID was coming? No, mm. no, we just did it uh, very strategically. Mm. We, we don't act upon opportunities. Mm. We put a plan together. So I have to disclose my secret that mm. maybe from the very beginning, mm. we had that plan, right? Mm. When is Hanoi? Yeah. So the minute you recruit, the, again, I go back to people. Mm -hmm. So we had the opportunity to recruit this great team and three of them or four of them were from Hanoi. Mm. So, all right. There you go. So we got them in Ho Chi Minh. They became very attached to the brand. They knew what they were doing. So now go on. Can enable and more things. Yes. Yeah. yes. Okay. Yeah, I, I asked that question too, because a lot of F&B operators are thinking, you know, Ho Chi Minh City is where it's at. Like, do we even look at Hanoi? And you know, I, having been in the business myself in the past and just talking to a lot of leaders like you, I kind of tell people, and again, this is purely my opinion, like get a strong foothold here. And if you could do it well, chances are you'll be okay in Hanoi. That's my general, very general advice, but it's good to, good to hear from, from you. So Dr. Hanoi is a great market mm. for Starbucks. How, how different are the two? It's a great market for us. Mm. Uh, that's that I can, I can say it. We love our Hanoi customers. Mm. They love our merchandise. They're big consumers of our limited time mm. offerings. Okay. And having the opportunity of experiencing the same brand in a market that has four seasons versus two is such a great, great learning and experience, right? You have the hot drinks selling so well in Hanoi. Mm. So it gives you, it, it makes it so interesting. Mm. Okay. Well, if you're in Hanoi, check out the Echo Park location. That's my favorite. Beautiful, oh, yeah. beautiful. It's fantastic. Yes. Patricia, we've talked a lot about the more macro conditions that uh, provide opportunity and challenges to Starbucks. We've talked about real estate. We've talked about just the perception of Starbucks as an American brand, all these different ideas and amazing insights. Thank you. I think everyone listening here today will learn a lot from this podcast and debunk some myths as well. My next question is more about the competition. So you mentioned a couple of international brands. Some have come, some have stayed, uh, some have gone away. Starbucks is still here mm -hmm. uh, and growing. What about the local competition? I mean, not just the, the local brands of the world, which have thousands of locations. That's one. 
but also the no-name brands, the family-run businesses, the mom-and-pop shops that are known for the ambience that we talked a lot, a little about. You know, sitting outside just with some friends. You know, it costs ten thousand for for a coffee. Probably not the best coffee, but what what do you have to say about that? Because also a lot of the people from outside are thinking, and I have so many friends from outside too. They think, oh, a dollar for a bun me, and I, I tell my friends. I never buy that stuff. Like you know, I occasionally like here and there, but not. It's not a regular occurrence for me. So, what do you have to say about the local competition, the 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 street side coffee versus the Starbucks experience? What is what do you tell the folks, especially from the outside or the business leaders, thinking about that? Like, how do you compete against that? Is it I even don't know a competition? That I compete. It's not even no. a competition, is it? No, yeah. they're amazing. I am. Mm. I I'm a resident of mm. the city. I love it. Mm. I go to the barbecue place around my corner, my my house. I sit on those uh, plastic stools and I have a great time. Mm-hmm. We sponsor them as as citizens of the city, and they do great, and we do great, mm-hmm. and it's a matter of learning to live with with your surroundings. Mm-hmm. So I respect what they do. They are hardworking people, and they serve a very good purpose, mm. right? They are the window of socialization. Mm. They are the ones that take you away from being connected all day, mm-hmm. uh, of s- replying emails. Mm-hmm. You sit there and sip a, maybe not a coffee, but a tea, while watching what's happening in front of you. It's fantastic. So... I think they are amazing, and I hope they never disappear. I want to talk about the hard numbers related to the community aspect you just mentioned, you know, being part of the social fabric of the community. Mm-hmm. I'm friends with one of your partners. Uh, he, he helped bring get Starbucks to Vietnam. This was must have been a year or two ago, and he was telling me how, uh, you know, his mission of bringing the world to Vietnam is kind of what facilitated Starbucks uh, coming here and expanding and growing. And he mentioned when they first came here, there was no Vietnamese coffee beans, correct me if I'm wrong, being used in Starbucks products. That's changed over time now. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Like, what was the perception? Oh, you're in Vietnam, which is the biggest producer, one of the biggest producers in the whole world, Mm -hmm. not just Asia for coffee, and you're not even using Vietnamese coffee beans. Now you are. Tell us about that shift and how that mindset uh, allowed Starbucks at a global level to be like, yeah, let's do it. And, sure. and how has that outcome played out? Sure. It would be wrong for me to say that because we are here, Starbucks started searching for coffee in Vietnam mm. because it's not true. The Starbucks coffee is a, has buyers across the world, mm. right? Coffee, a country of origin, uh, are always of course, visited by the Starbucks buyers organization. Mm. So they had already been here. Mm. Um, but they weren't buying. They were not buying because, because of the differences in what Vietnam was producing, mm. right? They were producing massive amounts of uh, coffee for different businesses. Mm. So now here there is a retailer that wants probably more boutique farmers that can Mm -hmm. cater to their needs. And that's what Starbucks coffee company had started for us. So when I, when we first came and set our company, I took my team to the lot and we visited the highlands and we talked to farmers and we saw what, what they were doing with coffee. And we decided from the very first time that we will involve the coffee farmers in our business. How so? By ensuring that each and every one of our partners knew where coffee comes from. So it would be, you will be surprised how many people don't know. I don't know. What a coffee Can you take me on a coffee tour? That's <laughs> reported. Uh, what a coffee, <laughs> what a coffee shrub looks like. Okay. How does coffee grow? Right. How difficult? How much work farmers put behind it? I, so, I, I think that's a story to tell a little bit. I mean, I can imagine already just you sharing here today. But I think the average of enemy's customer maybe doesn't know that. I could be wrong. Yeah, yeah. I, I, my perception is. I can tell like you, my I, partners didn't yeah. know. Yeah. 
They didn't. Wow. No. Okay. No. Yeah, I think, no. Uh, All Vietnamese newly hire employees of Starbucks that were very proud of preparing mm. all these drinks with coffee that yeah. had no clue mm. how coffee grows and the process of from shrub to cup, mm. right? Okay. So we got involved in those visits. And of course that brought more awareness And yes, of course, a Starbucks coffee is now in Vietnam. Mm. So it was very easy for me to link with the Starbucks coffee buyers, to get them involved, to ensure we start working with farmers, with big coffee organizations that support farmers for quality, for consistency, for ensuring their crop gives the best yields, etc. So yes. From now, from 2017, 16 or 17, we introduced, we presented in Vietnam the first Starbucks Vietnam coffee. Okay. Very good. Yes. Cool. So we are very proud good of that. that shift. Are, is, is Starbucks uh, globally now also using Vietnamese beans? It is yes. now. Okay. Yes. It's a limited time offering. Got it. But yes, yes. Actually, a friend of mine who lives in Switzerland mm. sent me a photo mm. of a bag of Starbucks Vietnamese. reserved yeah. Dalat. Amazing. Yes. Great to see Vietnam going to the world. I have another topic here, Patricia, that I know you personally are very passionate about. Uh, it's about sustainability. And I, I mean that not just from an economic business sense. We talked a lot about that already, but also in the environment and um, the way that we work with supply chains and farmers, which comes to my question. Starbucks is using plastic still. I, that's a very basic consumer question. Then I'll talk about the big stuff. Yeah, I love your comment on that. Why? Why is that still like? I, I remember a few years ago uh, there was a big, like plastic straw exhibition that I th believe Starbucks uh, yes. sponsored. Yes, uh, I don't remember the exact details, but I remember the visual. Uh, but yet, pl Starbucks is still using plastic. Yes. What, what's the story behind that? So first is we're steering away, of course, like the rest of the world. Mm -hmm from coffee, uh, from plastic, sorry. So how do we do that, right? Cannot just take it away. So what we did is we replace it. Mm. And now we utilize plastic, recyclable plastic. Mm. That's the first step. Uh, we have so much work to do here, but we have implemented many other measures that I'm going to take the opportunity to announce this okay. because very few people know. Mm -hmm. So since day one, so February 1st, 2013, it's on the menu board. We offer 10,000 Vietnamese dong rebate every time you bring your tumbler. It's still ongoing. Has been on the board mm -hmm. for 10 years. D so How many people actually adopt that? Do you have any numbers behind that? Very few. Very few. Why is that? Oh, I forgot. So <laughs> we are now campaign, actively campaigning. Okay. And again, I'm going to use your venue to promote bring your cup. It doesn't have to be our tumbler. It doesn't have to be a tumbler. It can be of any material. You can bring your mug for all purposes. If your office is next door, Come down, get your coffee, and go back to work. And you will get 10,000 Vietnamese dong off your bill. Every time. And you mentioned very time. few people. Why is that, though? Well, let me tell you another story. Do they like so, the logo on the cup? Do they, it's just convenient? You mentioned, yeah, probably. Or maybe I also have to give them the benefit, right? The reality is probably Vietnam is starting to be very aware of how important it is to be responsible mm. in what we use and how we use it and how we get rid of it. Mm. How, where is the garbage going? And I think that is right now a very big subject that probably started getting stronger and stronger during and after COVID. Mm. Another advertisement is Starbucks offers for here okay cups for cups and glasses and i can tell you that 85 of our customers 
consume their products in our stores. Okay. So when the cashier asks for here to go, please say for here. So we will not serve your drink in a paper or plastic. We will serve it on ceramic or glass, mm -hmm. and then we will take care of the cleaning. Mm. And that will be so, so revolutionary, mm -hmm. right? And that's, we also started the, the change for natural materials on okay. straws, which is when we, when you saw that event of the straw that we did together with a couple of very interesting organizations and was very successful. We change immediately to a strawless lid, mm. which allows you to just push the lid and do not ask for either a natural straw or any straw. Another question for you, Patricia. Going back to the original question, which was, or you mentioned the uh, 10,000 rebate. You mentioned very few people actually use it for whatever reasons mm -hmm. it might be, mm -hmm. which you should do a, stu a study about, actually. Uh, maybe we can do that together. <laughs> sure. Do Vietnamese even care about this? That's my, that's my follow-up question. I mean, I, you, you obviously, your team is trying a few things here and there. Yes. You've been doing it since the beginning. Oh, not you, here and there. You, oh, here and there. Okay. <laughs> it's well, very consistent. Okay, it's very consistent. Very consistent. You clearly offline have told me you're very interested in this space. Very. Do Vietnamese care, though? And is it, you know, there's this term globally known as greenwashing. I'm sure you know. I'm not yes. saying Starbucks is no. that, but no. you know, a lot of people are accused of it. Yeah. Like for instance, um, I recently read in the report the government of France recently banned flights of less than two hours, uh, and you have to take the train instead. Yes. But apparently, it only affects less than one percent of all flights. Um, which tr so like, what's the impact? Right. It's it's nice to say these things, but is it actually delivering? I disagree. So. I disagree. I think that by doing that, mm. the French government is changing behaviors. Mm. And if your flight is two, two hours and 10 minutes, and you already tried the, the train before, and uh, it was uh, comfortable and inexpensive, and your next flight is two hours, 10 or two hours, 20 minutes, mm. you're most likely to take the train again. You've been doing the rebate for 10 years though. Yes. Why has it taken so long and still very mm. few people are adopting it? Be I have to take responsibility, right? We are a very quiet company. Mm. We don't respond to negative media. We mm. don't fight. We don't. We don't. We just do the things we need to do, and mm. we know we have to, and we want to, and we just consistently do that. Mm. Perhaps what is missing is advertise it a little more. <laughs> so... Again, I'm taking the opportunity. I, I think you sp should sponsor my show. I can put in. The <laughs> yes. <laughs> we can talk yes. about that later, yes. right? Okay. So, um, no, let's stick to that. Okay. Don't change the subject. Sure. No, sure. I so, I want to make sure that the message is very yeah. clear and I answer your question. Mm. Do Vietnamese care? Yes. Mm. I cannot believe they don't care. Mm -hmm. Cannot. Mm. I do... No, changing behavior is the most difficult, mm -hmm. the most difficult task. And uh, we are all responsible. We all need to take responsibility. And perhaps we all need to help each other to make sure that we show our care more. Mm. Okay. Well, maybe I, I have to start getting my own Tumblr. I, I, I don't have one. There so. you go. <laughs> I'd love a Starbucks one. <laughs> There you go. Very good, Patricia. Thank you for answering that. Um, I'm going to move to the future a little bit, especially, well, okay, not so much about the future. That's my last question. My second to last question is, you're a female leader here in Vietnam. Vietnam is known for female leadership, I would say, generally speaking. So you're not, uh, I guess you could say, an outlier necessarily. No. But there are some challenges related to that. And I think for young our young listeners who are women who are thinking about uh, becoming that white collar office worker who's part of a big company doing great things. What, what's your advice for them to, to get there, to achieve that uh, standard career-wise that they're accepted and respected at work as a woman uh, here in Vietnam? Is, do you, have you encountered anything uh, challenging for women here in Vietnam too? No, nothing different. Mm. And I, it, 
I completely agree. This is a very different country in society with regards to respect for female in general. Mm. So the mothers are awesome. The grandmothers are the holders of the family. I can see the female coffee farmers are the ones driving the farm. Mm. So I see the role of women in Vietnam taking a front role, right? If a female, young female coming from university is thinking that things ahead are difficult, don't give up. Mm. Definitely don't give up. I was a barista. I used to work for a Starbucks coffee company behind the bar making lattes. And this was many, many years ago. And no, you cannot ask me exactly how many. <laughs> uh, uh, well, <laughs> did you imagine you'd ever be a director, let alone a CEO at a, a Starbucks in, in a foreign country? Could you have ever imagined that? I imagine that I would um, venture to work in different countries. Okay. I never imagined I would be running the country, the Starbucks coffee, mm. Vietnam. No. Yeah. Okay. No. I would say pursue your dreams. You're in the perfect, perfect environment. Uh, respect yourself. Make sure that everybody around you respects yourself, respects you. And be yourself. Mm. Be yourself. This, the environment is prime. Ready. Biggest biggest lesson there, everyone, is uh, be nice to your barista because you never know who, where they'll be. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, be nice to your barista. Yeah. Be because, nice to everybody. Yes, um, because they prepare your wonderful coffee every day. Looking ahead, uh, which is my uh, last question here, Patricia, and thank you for joining us on today's show. Um, what's the future hold for Starbucks? I, you know, that's a very broad question. Uh, but what, what would you say are the pillars of focuses going in, in the next? 10, almost 11 years of Starbucks here in Vietnam, what would you say, uh, what can you share that customers can kind of take away to remember about the future of Starbucks? I think, as I said before, Starbucks is here to, to stay, to grow, to become part of many more experiences on the daily basis. There are limitless possibilities to the brand, Mm -hmm. um, we want to continue being this strong employer that sets the pace on how to develop your team. Uh, we are proud of our baristas that become store managers, district managers, and, and so on. We want to continue building relationships with our communities. Uh, we will continue working in social responsible causes like cleanups, like uh, Water Planet Foundation, supporting uh, young Vietnamese at risk, um, et cetera. We will continue working with the coffee farmers of the highlands in Vietnam to ensure that Starbucks continues to uh, purvey their coffee in this country. I, I just see an amazing future ahead mm. of us. Okay. Very good. So there's one last question I always like to round out every podcast. Uh, and for thank you for coming to the studio again, too. We cover a wide range of topics on the Vietnam Innovators podcast. Uh, one of them, of course, is food and beverage. My question for you, though, is you obviously know a lot about the industry. That's great. And thank you for sharing so many valuable insights today. I think a huge takeaway for me, especially a great way to start a, mo uh, a Tuesday morning in my case. Patricia, uh, what would you like to know more about? As in, if I were to release another episode of the podcast today, uh, what would you, uh, how would I make you click on that? Like, what kind of topic, guest, or industry will make you like, oh, I really want to listen to that because I need to learn about this? What, what would that be for you, given the context of where you are in your career, what you know, what you don't know? What would that be? I would be very, very interested in hearing how is the supply chain within Vietnam mm. going to face the challenges of a near future, including um, the green or greener environment. I would love to see when is Vietnam starting to produce electric, uh, el, el, 
trucks, for example. Mm. When does the lat become more part of our daily consumption of those amazing products that they have? And many times they cannot reach the city uh, on time, and therefore most of them go overseas. Mm. And I would love to hear more about how is the country moving towards a more circular economy. Okay. Well, very good. If you're in any of those spaces that Patricia just mentioned, drop us a note. We'd love to have you speak to you, possibly having you on the show. Uh, I think some great learnings from that uh, that I'm sure Patricia would appreciate. Definitely. Patricia, thank you so much for being on the show. You debunked a lot of myths and learnings today. Uh, most of them good, I would say, uh, in general. So thank you so much for sharing. And I, I, I do hope our listeners do appreciate. Guys, if you really like this podcast today, make sure to subscribe and like the podcast, uh, share with your friends. I'm sure Patricia would love more of you to be thank getting you. that 10,000 dong rebate <laughs> yes. at Starbucks. I will be as well. Um, Patricia, thanks so much again. And uh, best of luck over the next 10 years for Starbucks. Thank you. Beyond. Thank so. you. Thank you. Very, very happy to be here this morning. Thank you. Very good. See you guys next time.